Hi guys, welcome back. So today we are going to be doing lesson nine. Um, I'm actually going to break this lesson up into lesson nine and like 9.5 um, just because I don't want the video to be too long and that's all, the only reason. So just know that because sort of we had to condense that schedule, um, lesson nine for some reason just became like literally 10 works. So I'm splitting it up into Favism and Expressionism and Dada and Surrealism. So sort of just like 9 and 9.5. So this will be lesson 9. We're going to be doing 131, The Goldfish, 132, Improvisation, 28, 133, Self-Portrait as a Soldier, and 134, Memorial Sheet for Karl Liebknecht. Now let's get right into things. Um, Goldfish by Henry Matisse is going to be the first work we're studying. Now, this is Fauvism, known as Fauvism. So while this was a brief period of artistic history, it was never really like formally organized. It did highly, highly influence movements to follow though. So I think that that's why it's important for us to sort of acknowledge it. Um, and works exhibited at this time were so crazy that critics described them as fauve, which was basically like another way to say a wild beast. So that's sort of where it like gets its name from. Now, goldfish um, were a really popular subject actually for Matisse. And they we first see goldfish in about the 17th century. They come from East Asia um, to... Europe, different parts of Europe, and goldfish came to symbolize um, a tranquil state of mind and a type of paradise. So that's sort of where we're going to see a lot of like symbolism within this piece. Now, Matisse is getting a lot of his artistic inspiration from Gagwin as well as Van Gogh, and he is exploring color in that way. So the effects of these really, really contrasting colors, these complementary colors. And he learned that if you place them next to each other, they actually all appear brighter. So that's sort of where that artistic influence is leading him to this like really colorful palette. Now, he also, within the style and form of this piece, we see a lot of tension between the way that the forms are depicted. So the fish are actually shown in two different ways. So sort of at the top of the bowl and then within the bowl, they're shown differently. And that's one way that he's sort of, you know, playing with that exploration. And the plants seem realistic as well as flat at the same time. So he's sort of like working with the distortion that glass would create and just different like perspectives. Um, the use of space in different ways. Um, now, this is heavily influenced by Cezanne. So like the way that space is distorted, um, we can see a lot of influences from Cezanne's still lives specifically. So the contrasting and complementary colors were heavily used by Favre's, including Matisse's first exploration of that in The Joy of Life, which was in 1905-06. Um, on the right, you can see an image of that and sort of just like how he's playing with those like bright, bright oranges, blues and teals and yellows, um, contrasting purple, pink, and he eventually softens the palette a bit, but he continues using those like bright oranges. It's just kind of more like muted. So this specific piece focuses on goldfish um, and many of his works incorporate goldfish. And we would have thought that that maybe came from his trips to Morocco. So life was more relaxed, more contemplative, slower paced there. And he really liked that feeling. So he was like, what's a way that I can symbolize that paradise? Um, through my still lives and that was through the use of the goldfish. So he wanted to, the viewer to find comfort and relaxation in viewing the fish and often we can sort of you know make that connection like if you've ever been at like a doctor's office or a restaurant that has like a tank of fish it's very tranquil to observe it in that way. Um, and now 
these plants and the garden furniture and the fish tank would all have been in Matisse's home um, in France. So we're sort of seeing, you know, like that artist just like painting what they're interested in. Um, and I think that that's quite interesting at the time as well. So although he's really exploring this like groundbreaking um, color palette, that's really like Matisse in style. Um, he is getting a lot of influences from other artists. Now, this painting is now exhibited at the Pushkin Museum of Art in Moscow. I love this piece. I think it's so, so interesting and just really pretty to look at. Um, so let's move on to Improvisation 28 um, by Kandinsky. Now, we're really getting into the abstraction paintings. So at this time, people realized that artists could potentially play a really important role in the emerging 20th century. So we're seeing Kandinsky's sort of influence on his ability to, you know, sort of be a political figure in creating this analogy of war. So this is actually two years before World War One, And the title, this leads to basically a change in the view of the physical nature, but also growing interest in abstraction. So like, how can we include represent representational things in a piece while still abstracting the form, line, shape, for example. Now the title is actually a notation that a composer would use. So I think that's quite interesting when we think about sort of where Kandinsky's getting ins inspiration from. Um, <clears throat> the function of this piece is to produce a strong visceral reaction from viewers and to basically capture their feelings in visual forms. So he's trying to convey feelings through color, through line, through space. And this is really where we're seeing color just for color's sake. Like what color makes you feel this way? If I create this harsh diagonal line, how will that make you feel? Um, sort of telling a story through these like intersecting lines, juxtapositions, spatial relationships, and that's sort of the the pioneer for abstraction paintings. Now, the title, which is like a, a notation a composer would use, he is composing a painting, um, and the painting and the music are similar without representing anything. So that's sort of where we're seeing that um, he's starting to become heavily influenced by the senses. So this term at the time called synesthesia is basically the idea that colors and shapes could be felt. So now today, the best way that I can think to sort of describe this to you is like when you see, um, a room painted, um, like red, for example, you're going to be like, oh, this is kind of unsettling to me. Maybe it makes me feel anger um, or romance. Um, but if I see a room that's like a cool beige, I'm like, oh, I feel peaceful. I feel tranquil. Maybe I feel reminiscent of the sand by the ocean. Or it's just sort of like the way that colors affect us and shapes <laughs> at this time. I don't know. This is kind of like a ridiculous example, but it's like, if you see like a really harsh, harsh diagonal like line, like maybe it's like a diamond or something, that would make you feel differently than a circle. So just sort of like the way that the mind interacts with the senses. Um, now we're seeing this being called an abstraction painting. So it's not an abstract painting. And that's really important to distinguish because he was deeply influenced by biblical imagery which and Christian stories, which we can see in this painting. So the, the, we see a battlefield, we see horses, we, we already know this is maybe about war. So we see some sort of like fighting and we also see a little bit of Jerusalem um, in the upper right corner. So we'll kind of zoom in on that in the next couple slides, but Kandinsky was Concern. So he wanted to include these things in this painting, but he was concerned that if we could recognize things too clearly, 
our conscious minds would just take over and close off our emotional abilities to respond to the color in the form. So I think that that's kind of interesting when it comes to abstract paintings. That's like we're not getting any direct forms. Now, if we look at this in the bottom left corner, there is kind of like it almost looks like a wave, which could be known to represent gods like wiping the earth um, of everyone except for Noah. That's like a really popular biblical story. These arches that are in the bottom sort of middle um, could represent horses or like a horse's mane. Now these are things we know just based on what art historians have researched. And now if we look in the upper right hand corner you can see what looks to be Jerusalem on a hill. Now the hazy sort of smoky smokiness that fills the background that is said to be you know sort of like the um the industrialization at the time like a steam or smoke. Um, now it's abstracted because it's an abstraction painting. So sort of like know that those are the influences, but that you're not going to be like, oh, yep, that's a painting of Jerusalem. That's where the abstraction comes in. So this painting is actually at the Guggenheim in New York, and it is fairly large next to these other Kandinsky's. Um, so quite remarkable, honestly. So let's move into self-portrait as a soldier. I'm doing pretty good on time. Um, so this is by Kirchner. Now, we're starting to see even more and more abstraction. And just by looking at it, we can notice some of the similar ways that human figures are represented. Um, in 1905, Kirchner, with several other young artists from Dresden, founded the German Expressionist group called Die Brücke, which basically means the bridge in Germany. In German, sorry. And this was a connection between the barbarism and the past of the modernity and the modernity and the future. So it's like basically see it as like the old and the new. It's the bridge between what was and what's to come. And they modeled their group after medieval craft guilds who would live together and practice art together. So they were heavily influenced by primitive works of art and ritual um, from like Africa and Central Asia and they liked how these cultures were more honest, direct, and natural and instead of sort of like the idealized art that was coming from Western Europe. So especially in industrialized Western Europe. So this is sort of around when tensions are leading into the First World War and there's increasing anxiety and discomfort around the expressionists. Um, so the function of this piece is basically to just to like focus on the negative effects of that and the negative effects of industrialization and also just the loneliness um, of that create that industrialization created because people didn't really need to go anywhere. They were really becoming more self-sufficient and that was creating a lot of loneliness for different citizens. Now, Kirchner at the time of the war, volunteered to serve as a driver so that he didn't have to be drafted into, you know, a more risky role where he was actually declared unfit for service due to issues with his health. So while he was sort of like on medical leave that we would call today, he was painting and he paints himself um, so this is, def is a self-portrait, like it is called in the title, as a soldier. So Kirchner is dressed in a uniform, but instead of standing on the battlefield, he is standing in his studio with an amputated bloody arm and a nude model behind him. So the severed hand is not actually a literal sever severed hand because we know he did not actually ever go to war, but it's sort of a metaphor for that experience. Now, in 1933, Hitler persecuted artists who painted outside the Aryan beliefs. Um, so there was a degenerate art exhibit, basically, that featured works that the Nazis hated um, in 1937. And 32 of Kirchner's works were exhibited at this time. Um, and 600 um, other works were removed from public collections. So like, 
these were not only Kirchner's works, like 600 works that were deemed like non-Aryan. Um, and then so during the war, Kirchner suffered a lot from alcoholism and drunk ab drug abuse. Um, he actually, at one point, his hands and feet were partially paralyzed. So we can also see a little bit of a connection between the severed arm and the paralyzed. Um, and in a sense of his fears about the war were self-fulfilling. So he like, would feel these feelings about the war and, you know, sort of react based on them. And he actually ended up killing himself in 1938. And this work is exhibited at the Allen Memorial Art Museum in Oberlin, Ohio. So I think that this is actually quite interesting, sort of like painting the struggles that the self goes through. Um, which we see really commonly today, but not so much at the time. Now, the last work that we're going to be doing is the memorial sheet for Carl Liebknecht. Now, this is by Kathy Kollwitz, and this is a woodcut. So our first, um, not painting. <laughs> um, so there's actually quite a bit of historical context behind this piece, just sort of as to like, who is Carl? And like, why are we making this woodcut about him? So I'm just going to like sort of read about this history and then we'll get into a little bit more of like Kollowitz's um, interference and why, you know, she's the artist at the time. So from the end of World War I, so late 1918, the founding of the, to the founding of the Weimar Republic in August of 1919, Germany went through a period of social and political upheaval. Germany was led by left-wing forces, so Marxist sympathies like the Social Democratic part of Germany and German Communist Party and Socialists and Communists both wanted to eliminate capitalism and establish communal control over the production of goods. But the, um, <laughs> the, they didn't really agree on how they wanted to do this. They basically, so there was basically a social revolution that put the government power in the hands of the workers. Um, the communists staged an uprising because they were like, no, we don't agree with that. That's not how we want to do this. They staged an uprising and they captured two leaders, Liebknecht and Luxembourg, which they both, they murdered on January 15th of 1919. And so now Kollwitz is basically making this piece as a response to the assassination of the communist leader. Carl Liebknecht, and this is like during the uprising. Now she's doing this because her family wanted her to, whereas the subject of her works would be more feminist typically, but politically charged as well. So let's talk a little bit about woodblock prints and then we'll kind of go back more into the content of this piece. So woodblock prints like many were very popular at the time because they allowed the widespread distribution of a message. So multiple prints in production make it ideal for spreading statements about politics. Um, think of this as like a newspaper, for example. You're not just making one painting that's taking you hours, you're making one woodblock print, which is taking you hours, but then you're printing multiple paint um, pieces off of it. So just sort of like that same concept of like, how can I have like a cheap and accessible medium that I can spread widely. Now, wood carving was very, very labor, labor intensive. Um, still is today. And, but she found this to be a good method for that reason. So had the energy and feeling similar to primitive societies that were influencing at the time. And basically a design is carved into a slab of wood, which is then covered with ink and printed onto paper. So Kathy Kollwitz is, like I was saying, she's known for prints that celebrated the light of the working class. Um, she rarely depicted people, but here she does. And she's not a communist, which um, you'd be like, hmm, then why are you painting this like iconography about Carl? Um, <laughs> but she heard him speak and she admired him and her family asked her to produce this print. So Kollwitz's career overlaps with German expressionists, um, but she was not really an expressionist herself. She was actually like a, almost a generation older than most expressionists at the time. So the function of this piece is to basically memorialize um, Liebknecht, but she does not really advocate for him. She just sort of is like, let's remember him. Um, so she focuses not really on 
Leibniz himself, rather the workers who had put their faith in him and sort of like his ideas and his leadership. And the focus on those broadly affected rather than those in the spotlight. So meaning the focus on those who were affected by this rather than like, okay, let's focus on like the icon in this picture. She's like, let's focus on who this actually like impacted, which is a really common theme in Colwitz's work anyways. So this piece is actually divided into sort of like three sections and it's like the top, the middle, and the bottom. So in the top section, it's packed with figures. So we're not really seeing the difference between foreground, middle ground, background. It's more so like the surface, it's just crowded. <laughs> and so let's kind of break it down top, middle, bottom. And the top is packed with figures to sort of um, give note to like there would have been many people gathered at the time to see this experience and the space is really compressed. Um, the middle draws attention to the bending mourner, so the person who's like over Leibniz's body, as well as the woman and the child. So I think that that's kind of an interesting to distinction to make. So it's creative. It shows a unique voice because at the time, like why would a woman and a child be in a painting or a print like this um where it's like a dominantly man-run environment but that's like Colwitz's um influence on this and then the bottom is the dark body of Leibniz now we can't help but think of this sort of as like a lamentation um which is really a traditional Christian form of art that depicts the followers of Christ mourning over his dead body and in this case Leibniz is kind of the um the Christ figure so the iconography would have been really recognizable by people at this time which was like sort of Colowitz's intention and this is in the Art Institute of Chicago and it's super tiny because it's a print so this probably isn't the only one, but this is one of the, you know, originals. So that is it for lesson nine. Remember, I'm splitting lesson nine into sort of like nine and 9.5. So stay tuned for lesson 9.5, which is Dada and Surrealism. And please let me know if y'all have any questions. Uh, like and subscribe, wash your hands, and I'll see you on the next one. Bye, guys.